Yep, all set. Okay. Hi, everyone. I am Ren Thomas. I am an assistant professor at the School of Planning at Dalhousie University, and I'm also a founding fellow of the McEachin Institute of Public Policy and Governance, and we are thrilled to have you here today. Um, I hope that everyone's able to connect. If you do have any issues, uh, we do have um, uh, Warren McDougall from McEachin. He can answer you in the chat window if you're having any difficulties. It looks like we're going okay so far. So welcome to uh, to our webinar today. So um, I would, uh, I'm very thrilled that my my student, my bachelor's thesis student, um, is going to be presenting her work today, Holly Blackmore. And Holly's work is based on a larger study conducted by Jacqueline Gahagan at um, the School of um, Health and Human Performance. And so what we will do today, uh, the format will be that um, I will, uh, just after this brief introduction, we'll have Jacqueline, um, she will give the context for the larger project, which was funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. And then uh, we'll have Holly present her findings, and then we'll come back to me and I'll moderate some of your questions. So if you do have any questions during, um, if you think of anything during Holly, Holly's presentation, or of course afterwards, please feel free to type those in the chat window and I will get back to those, I will get to those uh, to, at the end of uh, Holly's presentation. So um, just a reminder that McKechn, a little bit about McKechn Institute, we are at, uh, the website is dal.ca slash MIPP. And we have been doing a number of webinars um, on housing and on LGBT housing as well around this project. So if you're interested in looking at any of our previous videos, um, you can look at our YouTube or our Facebook site, or of course on our, on our website to find more information about those. Um, McKechn is, is really trying to get more people to engage in public policy discussions, including uh, members of the public. So we're really thrilled to have, I think, some people um, from uh, across the country today joining us. Um, in from different areas of policy development, but also people who are just interested in, in this issue or around housing and LGBT communities. Um, so we will be recording today's, um, today's uh, webinar and it will be made available on the knowledge platform for the larger project, which Jacqueline will talk about. So without any further preamble, I will introduce Dr. Jacqueline Gehagen and she will give you an overview of the larger project. Great, thanks Ren, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, I'm a professor of health promotion at Dalhousie University, and I'd like to acknowledge that Dalhousie University is actually located on the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Mi'kmaq people, and that we are all treaty people. So my job is uh, to walk you through quite quickly um, a bit of a backgrounder on this one-year uh, SHRC-funded partnership grant. And so I'd like to start just by acknowledging that there are a number of pieces of this research that grew out of our earlier work with the European Union Center of Excellence, which is also housed at Dalhousie University. And that earlier work was actually looking at housing as a key determinant of health. And we found that um, housing uh, is an important area for health and social interventions and programs. There's a lot of rhetoric out in the literature about aging in place. And what we're trying to look at is how do those policies actually apply to older LGBT uh, populations. Um, and basically what we found in our earlier work with the EU is that we need more innovative policies and programs to meet the unique needs of older LGBT Canadians from across the life force. So our current research team, and this is uh, what Holly is going to be presenting her thesis on, uh, is related to the, the larger study that we did in Canada. And the title of that was Addressing the Knowledge Gaps and Meeting the Housing Needs of Older LGBT Canadians from research to policy to practice. And there were three data points. And what Holly's gonna be presenting on is a subset of the online survey data. But just for those of you who are not familiar with this study, we have three data points, including an initial scoping review of the existing housing literature, um, looking at specifically at older LGB populations and how their housing needs are being met. Uh, we also conducted an online survey, which was rolled out nationally in both French and English. Uh, when we had a series of focus groups that uh, occurred in November uh, 19, uh, last year, uh, 2019. And just very briefly for the scoping review, this is to give you sort of a, a broad sense of what's in the literature, and it's not really meant to dig down in any one particular area. But what we found was um, types of housing, uh, are, that's obviously an important area to look at, as well as uh, issues such as neighborhoods or communities or um, uh, rural versus urban locations, 
and also issues of homelessness. And this is keeping in mind that the National Housing Strategy has two key priorities, one of which is uh, housing uh, precarity and uh, homelessness, and the other one is around affordability. Um, so we also looked at um, uh, issues of, you know, what kinds of innovative um, uh, policies or programs were in the literature and what we found sadly is that most of the studies were descriptive in nature and in other words they didn't really give us direction on what kinds of interventions um, could potentially be used or scaled up in the Canadian context and many of them were um, talking about individual uh, instances of housing facilities as opposed to um, solution level or system level solutions rather. So what does this mean? Just very briefly, there's a long-standing tension we know between the realities of LGBT populations and our housing needs uh, and sort of standard, and you know, Holly's gonna get into this sort of one size fits all policies, programs and funding models um, don't necessarily um, capture the needs of more diverse and socially marginalized populations. So we need better system level um, understanding of these issues and we also need um, better administrative data on LGBT populations. I won't go through all of the online um, survey data. This is just a very brief snapshot of um, some of the, the demographic data. Um, as Ren pointed out, this information will be, will be available for uh, people to download off our learning platform. Um, if you need more information about how to access that learning platform, you can contact us after this session. Um, focus groups, as I mentioned, we did uh, five focus groups in uh, Ottawa, Calgary, uh, Winnipeg, Nanaimo, and Halifax, and essentially we invited folks who are older LGBTQ folks to talk about their housing needs and issues, and we also invited housing providers to, to do the same. I won't go through all of this in any detail. Um, this will be available in a final report from the study, but some of the key issues included a lack of LGBT-focused options, the, needs to, the need to hide one's sexual orientation or gender identity when uh, accessing um, housing or speaking to housing providers or in interacting with residents, then fear of violence and harassment from residents, um, fear of being too visible, being ostracized, and being in a non-affirming location with non-affirming staff, um, and that LGBT homelessness um, contributes to loneliness and uh, isolation. So what can we do? We can advocate for a national program of housing research focused specifically on these unmet needs um, from an intergenerational justice perspective. In other words, looking at the needs of older and younger LGBTQ Canadians when it comes to their housing needs. We're also looking at um, seeking additional funding to continue to move this work forward. And lastly, we're going to uh, continue to mobilize our findings as we're doing today in this webinar. Um, and look at other ways of connecting with individuals from government and community to uh, mobilize for change. <clears throat> so by way of wrap up, I just wanted to thank our team for their contributions to this, uh, this SHIRT grant. I'd like to thank the McKechnie Institute uh, for uh, providing the space for this webinar and big shout out to Dr. Ren Thomas and Holly Blackmore for presenting data from uh, the survey. So I will um, stop there. Uh, and turn it back over to Ren. But for those of you who want more information about the study in general, or if you'd like information about the learning platform where these additional materials can be found, um, please feel free to email me at jkahagan at dal.ca. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jackie. Um, so that was a really great context for the uh, larger study. Um, and um, we're really hoping to um, be doing a lot more knowledge dissemination on this project over uh, the next few months. So hopefully, um, once that knowledge, um, knowledge platform is up and running, we can share that information with you. And for now, we would like to turn it over to Holly Blackmore, who is going to be presenting the survey analysis. Holly? Thanks, Ren. Um, thank you, Jacqueline, uh, for that introduction. Um, so I'm just going to get my screen up here. There we go. OK. So hi, everyone. I am Holly. Uh, I recently completed my undergraduate degree in community design and sustainability at Dalhousie. This past year, I completed my planning honors thesis on the topic of identifying barriers associated with LGBT seniors housing and looking at opportunities moving forward. And uh, my thesis was supervised by Ren Thomas. 
So for a bit of background on my research, as Jacqueline had mentioned, it's part of the larger study that um, is being conducted uh, by researchers at Dal and across Can um, Canada, aiming to gain a better understanding of the current state of housing and services for LGBT seniors. And again, as Jacqueline had mentioned, this included um, focus groups, surveys, and also a scoping review, and my thesis uh, looks at the surveys. So the purpose of my thesis within the larger um, study was to uncover themes within the survey data and to determine major barriers and fears of LGBT seniors which relate to housing. Um, it's important to note before I go any further that throughout the presentation you'll notice that two acronyms are used uh, for the LGBT community throughout the presentation. This is because the term 2SLGBTQ was used uh, for the survey and so for that reason I will use it whenever I mention the survey directly um, or show graphs from the results. However, LGBT is used most commonly through the presentation um, as it was decided by the larger study that this acronym is, is most appropriate for the senior population. So moving uh, to my objectives, there were three objectives of my thesis. The first was to determine fears and barriers associated with housing for LGBT seniors in Canada. The second was to explore this topic of one size fits all housing models and to determine their effectiveness for the LGBT senior population. So I did this using evidence um, from the survey results as well as peer reviewed and also gray literature. So there wasn't a whole lot um, in the literature directly related to one size fits all housing, specifically um, in discussing one size fits all housing uh, for the LGBT senior population. So when I talk about one size fits all, um, I'm doing it with the understanding that this type of housing uh, discusses a housing strategy which sets a standard for developments based on a generalization of needs and that's not specific to any group of individuals. Oh, sorry, I skipped over the last one there. That was uh, number three to determine how the results from the survey translate specifically to planning um, and what key findings from the research could influence future planning decisions. So a bit of rationale about uh, for my research. Um, finding suitable housing can be a challenge for all seniors, uh, but it may be particularly stressful for often marginalized groups such as seniors who identify as LGBT. Uh, many seniors who identify as LGBT fear being discriminated uh, against by other resident staff and also housing service providers. Um, however, housing developments designed to be um, LGBT inclusive uh, can make the transition to a seniors housing less stressful. Research shows that inclusive housing accommodations have been developed successfully in the United States and Europe. And so this type of housing would likely also benefit or be of benefit in Canada. Uh, the methods for my research included a thematic analysis of 18 open-ended survey questions. Um, so there were three different survey options. There was a survey for 2SLGBTQ populations, um, a survey for housing service providers, and then there was an option um, for housing service providers who identify as LGBT, and they would uh, participate in both surveys, or 2SLGBTQ, excuse me. Um, so. Uh, there were 18 survey questions that I looked at. There were eight from the survey for um, 2SLGBTQ populations and 10 from the survey for housing service providers. And I coded this, these thematically using MaxQDA online coding software, as well as the focus group codes that were created by um, Mount St. Vincent University student Marco Redden. Um, I also did a comparison of my findings to existing literature, and I also created support graphs um, using the original opinion document from the survey of some of the closed ended survey questions. And I did this uh, to support the findings of my thematic analysis. So the data that I analyzed from both surveys was coded into five main themes. These themes are as follows, barriers to safe and affordable housing, housing type interventions, networks of support and creating two SLG for LGBT inclusive accommodations. Um, so these main themes were also from the focus group codes determined by Marco Redden, and many sub-themes were created within these five major themes, and they varied slightly uh, between the housing uh, for the survey for 2SLGBTQ populations and the survey for housing service providers. So now I'm gonna go over a few of the graphs um, that were created to support the findings of the thematic analysis. So the graph on the left shows survey type. As you can see, the majority 
majority of respondents participated in the survey for two SLGBTQ populations. And then the graph on the right shows um, sources for housing information. And as you can see, the majority of people get their uh, information from social media or from friends, and the least amount get their uh, housing information from government agencies or from family. So this kind of shows that there is currently a gap um, and there's an opportunity for government agencies to provide um, more information to uh, the LGBT uh, community um, regarding housing resources and things like that. So this graph uh, shows the responses to a question which asks the, the 2S LGBTQ population how supportive the community that they currently live in is. Um, so the majority said that their community is somewhat supportive. However, 13% did say that their community was unsupportive, whether that was somewhat unsupportive or very unsupportive. Uh, this is from the survey for housing service providers, and this shows the type of housing service providers. So the majority fell um, under an occupation that's not that wasn't listed here, um, but of the ones provided, most were either a landlord or a housing support worker. And both of these graphs um, show the responses to a question which asks um, both the the uh, individuals from two SLGBTQ populations, as well as housing service providers, um, to rank the importance of diversity training for staff working in the housing sector. So as you can see, uh, both survey populations thought that this was something that was very important. So these three graphs um, are all from the survey for two SLGBTQ populations, and they show uh, three other um, important housing components, and these are anti-discrimination laws specific for the housing sector, um, funding for co-op housing and the creation of 2S LGBTQ communities, and lastly, affordable housing policies. And as you can see, all of these were considered to be very important. So once all of the codes were applied to the survey data, I created code clouds to demonstrate the weight of the various themes and sub-themes. Um, so this cloud shows all of the themes and sub-themes um, for the survey for 2S LGBTQ populations. Um, so the largest themes and sub-themes um, were the most common throughout the survey. They had the highest number of mentions and then the smallest had the least number of mentions. So as you can see, the most common were barriers to safe and affordable housing, creating LGBT inclusive accommodations, um, as well as uh, discrimination, general housing issues, feeling of acceptance, um, things like that. And again, this was from the survey for two SLGBTQ populations. And then this is the code cloud for all of the themes and sub themes for the survey for housing service providers. Uh, so the most common ones here were creating LGBT inclusive accommodations, uh, barriers to safe and affordable housing, interventions, networks of support, um, feeling of acceptance again, um, things like that. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the standout sub-themes, and these were standout sub-themes due to their number of mentions. So uh, this is for the barriers to safe and affordable housing theme um, for, the 2S, for the survey for 2S LGBTQ populations. I should mention that these only apply to the participants who chose to leave a written comment in the space that asked them to elaborate on a certain survey question. Um, so these do not account for the entire survey population. And of course, this is based on my own perception of the data. Uh, so 46 respondents expressed that finding affordable housing has been a challenge that they've experienced. Um, 55 expressed that they have experienced some sort of discrimination in their housing situation. Um, moving on to the theme of creating LGBT inclusive accommodations, some standout sub themes here were that um, 44 respondents discussed the importance of a feeling of acceptance in inclusive accommodations and 29 discuss a non discriminatory living environment and the importance of, of that. So moving to the survey for housing service providers, this was the theme of bar barriers to safe and affordable housing. Uh, 24 respondents mentioned a lack of inclusion practices, either enforced or measurements currently taken to create a more inclusive work environment. And 16 say they are unaware of any current policies or practices uh, for providing services to 2S LGBTQ populations. 
this was the housing service provider survey and this was the main theme of interventions. So 31 respondents mentioned the importance of accessibility of information, information or transparency of information um, for both housing service providers as well as to us LGBTQ community members and 28 discussed the use of policy and practice um, for interventions for creating a more accepting work environment. So now I'm going to talk about six key findings from my research. Um, major barriers and fears um, experienced by LGBT senior community members uh, was, of course, the main um, concern for my findings. So this was things like uh, fear of discrimination, um, house, general housing challenges, health challenges, um, um, discrimination more generally, uh, things like that. Um, uh, then I looked at barriers uh, from a housing service provider perspective. So these were similar, um, but there were also things that uh, directly related to uh, their work environment. And then uh, it was clear from the housing service provider survey that there's a lack of information and education opportunities currently available for them. Also major considerations for creating LGBT inclusive accommodations. Uh, this, these were things like housing stability, disclosure as a choice, um, feeling of acceptance. And it was clear uh, that, that uh, the relationships that people have with their landlords and neighbors plays a major role in how safe or unsafe they may feel in their living environment. So this relates to one of the uh, main topics that I looked at um, for uh, my literature review, which was family of choice. Um, and how important networks and community is for the LGBT senior community. So this community-based approach uh, for housing seems to be something that's very beneficial. Also, there are numerous interventions to consider uh, as tools for creating inclusive accommodations, such as uh, policies and practices. Networks of support are vital, as I had just mentioned, for the LGBT population. Um, and this was also recognized in the survey for housing service providers. And the results show mixed opinions regarding housing specifically for seniors who identify as LGBT. However, most believe that this type of housing would be beneficial. Um, most of this, um, these mixed opinions came from people being concerned that this type of housing could potentially segregate the LGBT senior community. Um, however, when we talk about LGBT inclusive accommodations, um, it's from, it's, it means that uh, these, these spaces are advertised as LGBT inclusive. However, um, there are housing options available for everyone. They just mean that uh, the space is, is respectful of all and um, that LGBT can feel, um, feel accepted in, the, in this space and feel comfortable there. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the one size fits all topic. So um, results from this research show that one size fits all housing is not conducive for a senior's home to meet the needs of all seniors and particularly those who identify as LGBT. Um, this type of housing would likely not into, take into account the needs of, LG, of the LGBT senior community, um, nor consider the potential discrimination that individuals may face in a standard senior's home. Um, whereas something like niche housing, which is described in the article by Matthews, Hill, and Fredrickson, Fredrickson uh, which is a housing development created for specific groups of people uh, who have various needs or interests. And then these needs and interests are reflected in the type of programming and resources that are, would likely be available through this type of housing. Um, so this could also be things like advocacy for the LGBT community um, and stuff like that that is available through uh, the housing. Um, so this type of niche housing would likely be a more inclusive option. So these are the five key topics found in the literature on LGBT seniors housing, which relate most to the findings of my research. I'm not going to go into too much detail about um, this. However, the six topics are uh, fear of discrimination, affordability, competency training for housing and healthcare service providers, which came up a lot throughout the literature as well as policy and practice. So this is things like anti-discrimination policies um, and housing development specifically for LGBT seniors. Uh, so my research confirms a lot of the previous research on this topic and particularly on these five 
uh, key components here. So in regards to recommendations for planning and implications for the planning practice, there are six main topics of in my results. Um, so these are uh, increased access to information for both housing service providers and members of the LGBT community related to housing options, services, and resources, um, and also housing programming, things like that. Um, mandatory, mandatory competency training opportunities for housing and care providers, um, and also ensuring that these um, that these training opportunities are easily accessible. So this could be done through like an online platform or something like that. Um, there's also opportunity to create some sort of certification program for housing service providers or housing development uh, to show that a space is certified as inclusive. This was done in the United States um, through SAGE and it seems to be a beneficial uh, initiative and I think could work well here as well. Of course, ongoing engagement between all stakeholders is important in any planning process um, and changes made at a policy level. So this could include anti-discrimination policies and things like that. And then affordable housing options for all Canadians as this was a major concern that was brought up throughout the surveys and uh, physical aid in housing developments as well. As many of the survey respondents mentioned that they have physical challenges, their health challenges that um, is not considered in their housing environment right now and their housing it actually impedes them because of their health challenges and things like that. So in conclusion, seniors who identify as LGBT may find it more difficult to transition to a senior care facility due to discrimination from other residents, staff, um, and housing service providers. My research provides evidence uh, to support the creation of housing developments uh, that are inclusive for the LGBT senior community in Canada, which could provide them with a safe living environment. Through the continuation of research and collaboration with LGBT populations, uh, I think that changes can be made in housing facilities, uh, existing housing facilities, and that new developments may be designed and built to serve the needs of all seniors. So I'd like to thank uh, Ren, uh, as well as Jacqueline, for their continuous support throughout this entire process. And also thank you to Warren and the McKechnie Institute for organizing this webinar. Um, these are just a couple of my sources here. Um, and thank you all for watching the presentation. So I'm open to questions now. Great, thank you, Holly. Um, so I will just take a look in the chat. I don't think we have, if anyone has questions, you can type them into the window here. Um, I will ask a couple of questions just to get us started here. Um, hopefully that'll um, get, get the ball rolling and people have other questions. So um, I guess first question, um, what, uh, Holly, what did you think that were the main differences between um, the, the respondents who were part of the LGBT community versus the providers? Like, how do you think that they responded differently? Yeah, um, it seemed that the housing service provider responses uh, were mainly focused on creating LGBT inclusive accommodations as well as what services and resources they currently have or maybe um, what are missing and how things uh, could improve. Um, however, responses from the 2S LGBTQ populations were generally uh, related to their personal experiences, whether they were good, uh, good or bad when it comes to housing and also barriers that they've faced. So I believe that this had a lot to do with the types of questions that were asked in, in both surveys as, as the questions did vary quite a bit. Um, yeah, I think that would probably be the biggest difference. However, there were a lot of similarities uh, between surveys as well. Yeah, so we uh, just have a little follow-up question here from Liesl Gamble who's asking, um, uh, what, what were, so I think you mentioned that she's asking again about the barriers that the housing providers spoke to. So um, yeah. I think that you mentioned a couple of them were around like the workplace, right? Like the yeah. kind of, yeah, and that would be a, made, probably a, one of the main differences. Yeah, definitely. Um, there were a few survey questions uh, specific to the workplace. Um, so a lot of those barriers did, did stem from that. Um, so things like a lack of information or um, maybe they didn't, they didn't feel comfortable uh, disclosing their gender identity or sexual orientation, um, things like that. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, we have a question from Damian Collins. Um, hi, Damian. <laughs> so he's asking um, that he's saying you briefly mentioned, mentioned co-op housing as having some potential in this area. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, um, I didn't look into co-op housing too much. However, from the, um, the surveys, quite a few people mentioned co-op housing uh, in a very positive way. So, um, yeah, I think, I think funding for co-op housing uh, is a great thing and something that seemed to be um, uh, that the survey respondents thought, also thought was was very beneficial and um, in the long answer questions there were quite a few uh, talking about positive experiences from co-op housing so so this then, I, I think, think this kind of goes on to your you you had that one um, point in your analysis around like the community like networks being being really important and yes for sure um, that was a major topic in the literature as well, um, strengthening those community connections. And uh, I think that co-op housing seems to be a way to do that. So, yeah. Okay, um, so this uh, I have a question from Horace Back, but maybe that kind of relates to um, the previous question, which he's saying he doesn't, didn't fully understand the difference between one size fits all and niche housing. So are these categories sort of exclusive of each other or, um, can, is, does niche housing potentially include both LGBT and non-LGBT people? Yeah, yeah so um, based on what I read, niche housing was kind of considered, um, like LGBT inclusive housing uh, was considered to be niche. So um, something, a housing development that's created for a specific uh, group of people based on their needs or interests. Um, whereas one size fits all would be kind of your standard um, housing development that's uh, that's not uh, set for for a certain a specific uh, sorry uh, <laughs> to to meet the needs of a specific group of people um, whereas ne whereas niche housing so like the LGBT um, housing uh, would be um, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, I think, so it sounds to me like it's similar to, like for example, there's housing specific for youth, uh, youth and young adults, which might offer, you were talking about the housing being related to the kind of supports that might be able to be offered. So with youth housing, they might have specific, um, you know, supports around, um, you know, lived, you know, gaining gaining, gaining life skills or job, you know, um, kind of job skills training or that kind of thing, which much might, might be more uh, specific to youth. Um, I guess that's yeah. maybe the idea behind the niche housing. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, exactly. So that would also be considered um, niche housing as well. So the types of programming and resources in this in this housing facility would be specific to the group of people that the housing is developed for. So in an LGBT housing development, um, say the resources are uh, involved around like advocacy and things like that um, for the LGBT population. Uh, and that is kind of what would make it niche. Um, and it would be advertised as such. So advertised as an LGBT inclusive housing development. Okay, um, we have, uh, thanks Horace for that question. And we have another question from Liesl, which is uh, based on your analysis, what question would you like to ask if you were doing another study? <laughs> oh my goodness, that is a good question. Um, oh my gosh. I think, I think there's a lot of um, opportunity for things like training and things like certification programs. And um, I think maybe getting more questions around that and around how that can be most effective and successful and um, available to people. I think those types of questions would be great as kind of like a next step as to how things can change in existing um, housing developments. So I think I think focusing on on those types of questions would be good, um, so that this type of uh, training and uh, information and resources are are most easily ac accessible to everybody. Yeah, I think those two things, the training and access to information, came out of the literature as well. So it's something we already know. So those seem like good. Potential extra questions. Thanks, Liesl. And now we have a question from Sean Waite. Sean is asking, do most long-term care facilities have anti-discrimination policies? 
do they include sexual orientation and or gender identity? And was this something that LGBT respondents mentioned when they were looking for a long-term care facility? That's, that's another really good question. Um, I am not entirely sure uh, about we had, a, we had a little bit of a response from the, um, the providers, right, where they were talking about the workplace and they were saying, it did seem like they were saying there was a lack of information on, or lack of training. Yeah, I think um, for housing service providers, they really felt like there was a lack of training opportunities and a lack of information given to them. Um, but it seemed that major the majority, if, if there was some sort of... Uh, training or if there was some sort of programming, it was based on an anti-discrimination policy type of thing. Um, yeah, I don't know if, if that helps. I think uh, Jackie can maybe have a little bit more of an answer to that because she did the focus groups. So that might be a little bit more, yeah. Yeah, I was just, I, I was just going to send a message to um, Sean, but I, I, it's probably easier just to say it. Um, so in the focus groups, Sean, we definitely did hear that there are policies in place, but there's no enforcement or um, oversight of those policies. So there are, um, you know, kind of federal policies around anti-discrimination, there are provincial policies, there are um, policies within facilities, but the question has been asked, how do you actually regulate and enforce that? And many people talked about fear of retaliation if they came forward with a complaint saying I've been discriminated against because I'm gay um, because there wasn't a sense of safety and willingness to actually deal with those issues so I think the disconnect is the policies might exist but the enforcement and regulation of it is not there essentially yeah so I think this uh, leads to another uh, question which might be um, so some of the providers actually mentioned that they they don't discriminate so this this maybe gets into another kind of one of Sean's questions there is like they, they had stated well we don't discriminate we offer our services to everybody or we offer our housing to everybody um, so do you see any any problems with that approach this kind of I guess goes back to that one-size-fits-all type question or yeah it definitely does um, it seems that some housing service uh, provider respondents um, didn't really take into account that the housing needs of LGBT seniors uh, may be different than the housing needs of other senior populations. Um, of course, non-discriminatory practices and policies are extremely important, uh, but it's also important to consider the other various aspects of housing that, are, that may be unique uh, to LGBT seniors and to create resources and services uh, that meet those needs. Uh, so I don't think that was considered in a lot of, in a lot of ways, if that answers your question, yeah. Good. Um, yeah, so have another couple of questions um, as well. So um, you mentioned that you think um, a certification program might be uh, like a training certification program, I guess it would be. Um, so could you talk a little bit more about that? Who do you think, what kinds of organizations do you think would be involved? And Yeah, um, so in my research, I found that um, SAGE in the United States, like I had mentioned, has a certification program. Um, and it's kind of like a lead certification type thing with bronze, silver, gold. Um, and it's basically to show that uh, a housing development is inclusive, uh, certified as in inclusive. So I think there's a number of organizations in Canada that could be involved in creating a certification program um, for competency training. So in my thesis, I mentioned um, some of these like provincial housing authorities, uh, nonprofit organizations. Um, Jacqueline also had mentioned the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation. So I think that could be uh, a great network as well. Um, yeah, I think there's lots of opportunity there to create something like that. Uh, I think Jackie, Jacqueline. You have a question? Or you wanted to comment on this? 
Yeah, no, I, I just want to thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to comment on the fact that in the process of putting the phase two grant together, um, a number of community organizations and national organizations that actually are um, advocacy organizations, such as EGAL Canada, um, and several other housing providers who specifically um, focus on the needs of more vulnerable populations or marginalized populations actually had developed their own training. And so I guess that, you know, the question I have, and this would be back to um, CMHC and the National Housing Strategy, should there be some oversight coming from government to ensure that, for example, um, housing facilities that get funding or supports through the federal government are actually adhering to those um, best practices policies to ensure that it's not just a policy for the sake of getting funding or policies in place for the sake of getting residents to, to move in, but actually there's some um, uh, regulation of that and that that regulation might you know, it's the carrot versus the stick. So there's, so there's a lot of energy coming from the community around this question of, of certifying um, facilities. The downside of it is we're, we, if we continue this way, I fear we're going to end up with a bit of a, um, uh, you know, go from one province to another and you're going to see the way those policies are enacted and regulated and monitored done differently. And I think there needs to be some national leadership on that question. Yeah, I agree for sure. Um, I think that would be really important to make sure that things are um, as they as they say they should be, um, and that things are actually being followed through, um, and that um, you know they maintain that certification or that they they maintain what they say, um, how they say things will be, um, the inclusivity of their um, housing development. Yeah, I think that would be very important. I think we see this with other sort of housing related policies or um, yeah so for example like tenant protection policies like they're they, they are like on the books but um, when you actually talk to tenants about them and when you actually look into kind of the evictions and um, threatened evictions and that kind of thing that they're you know they're actually um, are they aren't actually being enforced in the way that they should be so so even when there is policy it still needs to be yeah there's still a role there I think you, you talked about earlier too that one of the your um, one of your graphs was showing like that most people aren't finding housing information from governments, right? They're finding it from, you know, other, you know, other sources. So there is kind of this other role there as well on, in terms of information. So information could be about the housing options, but it can, could also be about things like certification programs and, and regulations and how they need to be, need to be approached. Um, yeah. And just one, just one other thing that we also heard is um, even where, um, older LGBTQ folks know that there are um, friends of theirs from the community in particular housing facilities. When they call the housing facility to, to ask, are you um, an LGBT affirming um, safe provider um, and do you have LGBT residents? the answer has been uniformly no. Um, and the person who's calling is actually a member of the LGBT senior community and they know people who are from the community living in those facilities. So I think one of the, one of the other pieces we heard from housing providers is the reluctance to actually collect demographic data on sexual orientation and gender identity um, or gender expression. And so there is a bit of a divide, housing providers not wanting to collect that and people who actually want to know this information, like are there actually LGBTQ folks there and would it be a safe and welcoming place for me to go? They want to be able to go through the Rolodex, if you will, of, of potential housing facilities and say, you know, yes, not only do they have a policy, but yes, they actually are collecting data and tracking to make sure that the housing experiences of LGBT seniors are, are on par with everybody else. So in other words, if you don't know who is in the mix, and this is to Holly's point about the sort of, you know, one size does not fit all, um, then you don't have that level of specificity of your data to develop more nuanced program um, or enforcement or other policies to actually address the needs of, of more uh, marginalized populations. Yeah, I think that lack, so lack of um, lack of data. Well, I mean, this is really the reason that the study was was done in the first place is because there isn't a lot of information uh, on people's um, yeah, like housing housing choices or um, or basically barriers to the, to the types of housing. So, 
Um, we have a question uh, from Kenna McDowell. So Kenna's asking um, if you could speak more to the physical aid requested by seniors. What kinds of aids do they require? Yeah, for sure. Um, so this, uh, from the surveys, it seemed more pretty general physical aid, um, like ramps and um, just assistance for them in the building, in their, in their physical building. Um, as their health declines, uh, they are not, they are not experiencing, um, or they are experiencing more troubles uh, because of their housing situation. So um, this is, of course, for all seniors, physical aid and the most accessible that they can be uh, is extremely important. Um, and it seemed to be a major challenge throughout the surveys. Health challenges was a major, major concern. Uh, and this seemed to be definitely an issue in a lot of housing developments that, that the physical accessibility just was not there. Um, so yeah, a lot of seniors who participate in the survey mentioned that they, they have a, a tough time because, because of the lack of accessibility in their, in their current housing situation. Yeah, this might be another good um, uh, information sort of, um, uh, I guess, target for information from government because most provinces have, you know, rehabilitation, residential rehabilitation grants available for homeowners, not for renters, though. So they'd have to, again, make their landlord maybe of, uh, aware of, of a program or a grant that, that is um, potentially there for things like, um, usually for health and safety issues. So it could be if, if they're having trouble getting electric mobility or, you know, things like grab bars and that kind of thing, um, they, they are usually are uh, small grants available for, for that kind of thing. Um, so I'm wondering if that speaks to that, again, information aspect. Um, that that role for governments. Yeah, yeah, it definitely does. I think that would be another um, really important avenue to continue um, gathering information and also providing information to people um, so that this can be made uh, a, a major concern um, and something that changes because uh, it's definitely, definitely an issue. Mm -hmm. Um, so I have, uh, I have one, one last question, unless we have other questions from people, but that's also, we can also answer those. Um, so, um, what, uh, I guess, how can housing data be collected differently to address the current, um, gaps? So we're finding that, you know, this kind of lack of data is a real issue. So we have uh, obviously the census, we have now a national or yeah, the, um, Canadian housing survey. Um, so is there any way that we can better collect data on this population in order to kind of try to answer some of these questions? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think maybe if people were provided uh, an option to uh, express a challenge that they've experienced uh, in regards to housing um, due to discrimination or um, one of the other barriers or any of the other barriers, but uh, discrimination, especially for the LGBT senior population um, that they've experienced in their housing situation. I don't know if that would be helpful in determining in, ter in determining these major issues and and um, seeing them on a more frequent basis and understanding that um, collecting more data on a more frequent basis. Um, as you mentioned, Ren, the National Housing Survey, uh, I guess likely looks at some of these challenges that people face related to housing um, and the quality of housing and affordability and things like that. Um, but I think it's also really important to look at this, these other pieces and these other barriers that people are facing and to somehow get those questions out there uh, more frequently. Um, uh, yeah, I think it's a, it's a tough question with like a national survey that you know that uh, the percentage of respondents who identify as LGBT is probably going to be fairly small, but yeah. Um, we have um, another question from Sean Waite, and he's asking, uh, he's saying older LGBT people are more likely to be living alone relative to heterosexuals. Did this come out in the interviews as an obstacle for securing safe housing? So for example, costs or emotional support? issues like that. Yeah, sorry, was this directed for the uh, focus groups or for the surveys? 
Uh, oh, actually, yeah, he did. Uh, well, that's a good question. We could ask um, if maybe Jackie has some insights from the focus group as well. Um, but in the survey, did we have any? Yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, as I had mentioned, uh, connection and that um, family of choice is extremely important um, in the LGBT community. Um, and being able to keep in close contact with those people um, is very important, uh, especially um, for the senior population. And uh, I think that loneliness is a challenge and that um, maybe some of these, these housing developments with different programming and resources and things like that can really help uh, increase so socialization um, within that housing development. So I think that's, that's another really important um, information piece, I think, is looking at specific programming um, to improve socialization opportunities and things like that. Um, yeah, no, I, in the, um, to answer Sean's question about the interviews, in the focus groups, we did hear that, um, you know, living alone and um, not having a family, uh, biological or family of origin to, to um, seek help from. So whether that's securing safe, affordable housing or to have somebody actually um, help you transition from independent living into assisted living, for example, um, lots of, uh, there are lots of concern about, about that and the fear of being outed and the fear of being in a safe um, space was the kind of the top priority is how do I actually know that the space I'm going into is safe and who from my, um, as Holly's pointed out, who from my chosen family can help me navigate that. And so one of the things that we did here is we need kind of a list of, you know, where are the LGBT affirming safe, affordable places in Canada and just do some geospatial mapping and probably wouldn't take very long because there's not that many of them, but at least try and grow that um, awareness of those places that do exist and use that as um, sort of leverage to grow, um, to, to grow the notion of where there are um, safe housing um, facilities. And so, you know, in the phase one grant, we did hear from people who are housing providers how do we know that there's actually a market for this? So how do we kind of uncover, if you will, the need and concerns about securing safe housing for LGBT older folks with the need of housing providers to sort of um, uh, ensure that there is a, a sufficient demand? So I think one of the, the issues that we were hoping to do in the next iteration of this work is to kind of develop more of a business plan like Rainbow Resource Center in Winnipeg has done and they've been working on that file for close to 30 years because what they're hearing from older LGBTQ folks is they are concerned about what um, various obstacles they'll face in getting into a, a safe affirming place and that um, a Rainbow Resource Center proposal is specifically uh, designated for older LGBT um, folks and and what Holly pointed out earlier is for some people that may not feel like a safe place to go to, but for others, it's definitely a safe, affirming and wanted place to go. So for sure, not having the supports that you would get from uh, um, uh, as many heterosexual folks with children do that their kids are responsible for finding their, their um, older, their, their aging parents a place to go and they can no longer live independently. There aren't the same sort of resources in place currently to help uh, with LGBTQ folks. And I think that's definitely a, a gap that we need to address. Mm -hmm. All right, well, this is, this looks like the end of our, if anyone has another question, <laughs> you can like type it in the window here. Um, looks like we're kind of to the end of our questions, I think from, uh, from uh, the uh, audience members. <laughs> so, um, did did Holly or Jacqueline? Did you have any last uh, things that you wanted to to say? Um, thank you all for <laughs> for uh, attending this presentation. I I really appreciate it. Um, I think this is such a such an important topic, and that uh, you know more research, more and more research is 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 being published on it, which is wonderful. Um, but, but I think it is still limited. So um, yeah, I think, I think this research will continue to grow and, and it's very important. So I look forward to seeing um, 
the changes that are to come. Um, and I just, um, I wanted to thank Holly for taking this on for her thesis project and uh, thank you to uh, her supervisor, Dr. Ren Thomas for um, making this happen. And, and I think this is a really important conversation to have. I just wanted to say one last thing about the next grant that we're putting in is related to housing impacts for older LGBT Canadians in relation to COVID-19. And we've been doing our due diligence trying to find where in the world, and I mean literally around the world, um, where that data is being collected. So we've, we've heard lots of really tragic uh, scenarios in um, seniors' residents um, around COVID-19 and just some deplorable conditions that are not being properly regulated. Um, but we're also not hearing um, how COVID-19 is impacting on the housing experiences of older LGBT Canadians. So for those of you who are listening, um, if you are interested in participating in that grant or if you've got suggestions on um, COVID-19 related housing questions or survey instruments that already exist, um, please reach out to us because we'd be very um, we'd be very happy to hear from you. And again, thank you to Holly and thank you to Ren and thank you to everybody for, for being um, part of this really important discussion. Uh, just before we end off, we're just having a couple of questions here from uh, Cheryl and Robert asking about um, the recording. Um, so Jacqueline, was that going to be available on the, it was going to be available on the project uh, platform, learning platform? Um, yeah, so thank you for that question. So we are going to have a, an overarching report that will include all three data points. So the scoping review findings, the focus group findings, and the survey findings. We've also asked Holly for permission to, um, and Ren, for permission to have her um, thesis available on that learning platform. And it's a really beautiful learning platform. So as information from this study um, becomes available, it's not just meant to be published, but it publishable as in papers that not everybody will have access to, but other materials such as policy briefs and other pieces of actionable outcomes from this project um, will be on that learning platform. But in the meantime, if people want um, uh, more information about the project uh, leading up to the, the release of those materials, please get in touch with us and we can certainly share, share with you what we have to date. All right, thanks a lot. Thanks everyone for joining us today. And thank you so much to uh, Warren McDougall and, uh, and McEachin Institute for uh, Public Pol Policy and Governance and uh, for hosting the webinar today and helping us advertise it. Um, we are looking forward to more dialogue with, uh, with all of you in the future around this topic. And we're hoping to see a lot more research and a lot more, um, you know, hopefully something like a certification uh, program or, or a process uh, so that people can have more housing options in the future. Thanks a lot for joining us.